Howdy, friendos. My name is Stuart, and welcome to another four so of characters that we plan to review this month. This month, we'll be taking a look at the four main protagonists of the popular shonen anime, Yu Yu Hakusho. This anime classic that still holds up is about slaying creatures of the underworld that happened decades before Demon Slayer and Bleach, and I'm very hyped to cover it. Check back every Tuesday this month as we will cover another of the foursome, with one week having a very special guest, but more details to come. This series centers around a delinquent named Yusuke Yurameshi, a loudmouth, arrogant dickhead bully that changes his life when he does something that God and the devil wouldn't have even thought of. He saved an innocent kid's life. What follows is a fantastic series covering several unique ideas, characters, and more, and it's still worth the watch. Honestly, if you've ever been on the fence about this show and you've seen Hunter Hunter, but not this, please do. I promise you, you won't regret it. However, before we begin at the character in question, you may not know this, but about an hour ago we launched the Kickstarter to the book that I've been working on for nearly the past year, the Complete Waifu Handbook Kickstarter. You may not know this, but day one is extremely important for the health of any Kickstarter. We are really pushing for a day one funding, and we could really use your help. If you liked anime-themed content in your D&D settings, and yeah, of course you do, you clicked on a video asking about the alignment of a goofy 90s anime boy, then head on over to where you can unlock seven new anime races for your campaign, 15 new classes and subclasses, over a dozen unique NPC, and a well-balanced cooking system for your campaign. And if you're at all like Kuwabara, maybe you would like to play as a Yurei or a ghost girl from Japanese folklore. And yeah, I know Yukina is a Yuki Ona and not a Yurei, but roll with the on me on this, I'm doing a bit. The Yurei come in six different types according to how they died. These Yurei are balanced to be as strong as a typical character race, but built to be unique enough to give yourself a more compelling backstory. If you hurry, there might be still time to sign up for the Early Bird Special, where you can get a copy of the book for 10% off, and if we reach $20,000 in funding, that early bird soft cover gets upgraded to a hard cover absolutely free. Head on over to the Complete Waifu Handbook Kickstarter today and check it out. And now back to the video. Kuwabara is an average 14 year old boy living in Japan. He has red hair, disrespects authority, has a height of six feet tall, abs like a train made of bricks, a voice with the base of a tuba, and intense spiritual powers. Kuwabara is a normal delinquent that is probably more thick-headed than even Yusuke, and if you know Yusuke, that is saying something. Stubborn to a fault, Kuwabara is ready to fight and kick all sorts of ass. However, underneath that very gruff exterior is one of the kindest people in this world. Kuwabara cares greatly for his friends and innocent animals, and if he can take a hit for someone who doesn't deserve it, he absolutely will. It's actually quite admirable, and while I would like to place him higher, at the start of the series, he's still a punk kid who's more focused on upping Yusuke in a fight. So we're gonna split the difference and put him at a very solid chaotic neutral, but lean him towards chaotic good. One thing I would like to point out is that these videos will be an especially rare two-parter from the loading crew. This month, we will be exclusively covering the events of season one and two, only covering the events up to the Dark Tournament. I feel like this is a good enough look at our boys, especially since I feel that this series peaked during this era of the show. Season 3 and 4 are both good, but they also raise a whole bunch of different questions, and it, it's just not as good as Dark Tournament, guys. Plus, we're covering a lot of characters this month, so, you know, just take the good with the bad. Plus, this means I have more fodder for D&D Sember. But with all that out of the way, let's go. Once inside the castle, I suggest you let us do the work. As far as I'm concerned, we're babysitting. See, that's the type of... I'm gonna kick your ass. Just when I think you've said the stupidest thing ever, you keep talking. You're calling me weak? Look at your little birdie arms. They're no thicker than a cigarette. I could smoke them little arms. The first episode of this series gets an extremely rare Nat 20 episode of War. Chris Sabat's performance as Kuwabara is especially gut-wrenching as he completely loses control of himself over Yusuke's funeral. And just like their principal said, it is more honorable that he is upset than all the teachers who is mocking him for his death. So we're going to mark making an emotional scene at your rival's funeral as chaotic good. <laughs> Something the matter, Kuwabara? I'm feeling the chill. Kuwabara does not get much agency in episode 2, unfortunately, since Yusuke's possessed his body in order to grope his girlfriend. Check out the episode when we get to Yusuke, when we get to it. <laughs> Once Yusuke leaves, he just kind of accepts that a cute girl is hugging him. We're gonna give him a true neutral for this. It's okay, just go on home now. Let's just call it an apology for yesterday. Thank you. 
In episode 3, we learn a great deal about Kuwabara's personal ethics. While he is a street punk who's looking to control territory, whatever that means, he is a gentleman and puts his friend's needs over his own. One of his close friends is at risk of losing his job, and if they get into a fight and don't pass an exam that they need to take, Kuwabara treats himself as a punching bag so that the other punks will leave his friends alone, and he studies his hardest to pass. Even after he gets screwed over, he holds himself back from bashing his teacher's face in. Lawful good. Yusuke's house is on fire! If you ever want to find him again, go help! Uh, something tells me I should go that way. <laughs> Saving your best friend's girlfriend from a house fire is neutral good. Unfortunately, during the episode that Yusuke needed a kiss from his homie to come back to life, Kuwabara could not hear him, and we won't count this against him. Hey, Ikichi! Hey, Ikichi, where are you? She's safe here with me. Later in that same episode, however, Kuwabara is blackmailed into steering a bunch of manga from some stores. He does this in order to save... A retarded fuzzball! Breaking no laws while fulfilling the need of a hostage exchange is lawful good. You messy! <laughs> Kuwabara? Hey, what the heck is going on? I mean, what are you doing here? Kuwabara doesn't actually make an appearance again until episode 9, however, where he joins Genkai's tournament. As explained earlier in the series, Kuwabara is quite spiritually inclined and has maximum spiritual awareness with an impressive adaptability and power. He joins Genkai's tournament mostly in order to get his powers under control. During the tournament, Yusuke and Kuwabara have an uneasy alliance as they both want to prevent any bad guys from getting Genkai's techniques. Kuwabara performs extremely well, but is knocked out in the semifinals by the main villain of the arc. During the tournament, however, Kuwabara fights with honor and tact, fighting fairly but fiercely. During this time, he learns to conjure a spirit sword. For this, and for teaming up with Yusuke, he actually gets a lawful good. So do your arms bend in the right direction now? Yeah, with Genkai's healing powers, I was only in bed for a day after the fight. After Yusuke wins the Genkai tournament, Kuwabara learns how to manifest the spirit sword on his own without the hilt that he got during the Genkai tournament. After Yusuke gets back, the next arc begins, which is admittedly fairly forgetful about how these four saint beasts are sending demon bugs into the real world and infecting people with zombie juice. Kuwabara, without hesitation, jumps into the fray with limited understanding. He then teams up with two other demons that he's never met before in order to save Japan. He fights a furry named Biako, attempts to save humans who have been cultivated by insects, and eventually saves Yusuke by giving him some spirit energy after the fight with the final boss. We're gonna give him two lawful goods for all of this. It is imperative that you bring her back quickly. I think I'm in love. What? The Rescue Yukina arc is when Kuwabara actually begins to shine as a character. We failed to mention that Kuwabara developed a crush on Botan in The Last Ding, but then immediately switched to Yukina once he saw how beautiful she was. Much to Botan's slight disappointment. I guess he's done being in love with you, Botan. Tarn. Kuwabara declares his love and gets involved into the arc that he literally was not invited to, but decided to show up anyway. What a man! Chaotic good. Hold on, my darling! Your brave man is coming! Additionally, during this time, Kuwabara continues to fight while flexing his personal code of ethics. He criticizes Yusuke for hitting a girl in a joke that I'm sure everyone on Twitter agrees has aged very well. He then performs an all-out do-or-die attack where he has Yusuke shoot a spirit gun into his back, which allows him to get the killing blow on the Takoro brothers. He rescues Yukina, and the day is saved. At least, so the protagonists think. Chaotic good. We're so glad that our client is pleased. Now my brother and I, we have a little favor to ask in return. Please give us an opportunity to fight with those boys again. Turns out the Tagoros are alive. The younger brother appears and destroys a parking garage and tells Yusuke and his friends that they must participate in a dark tournament in two months or they will be killed. So without any choice in the matter, the characters train for two months. Kuwabara is left to his own devices but manages to get much stronger within that time. True neutral. Now I can kill as many apparitions as I want to after I turn that human boy your meshy inside out, of course. <laughs> Uh, what did he say about the human? Once the tournament begins, Team Yurameshi needs to participate in a free-for-all on the transport boat to qualify, which they easily do. After reaching the island, the team are harassed by their first round opponents, Team Rikuikai. Kuwabara faces off against Riku and regrettably loses, but this fight is so close that Riku decides to nope out of the next fight. Also because Kuwabara is kinda dumb, he lost by not paying attention to the 10 count. Chaotic good. Three! Yeah! 
That was the most exciting finish Four. I've ever seen! The rest of round one goes off without much input from Kuwabara, aside from a comment here or there. As the round is over, he and Yusuke watch the Taguro brothers effortlessly pass their next round. Tell them to go away! They shouldn't be here. Team Ichigaki is a difficult round for our heroes. Turns out they are being led by a scientist demon who has used some demon parasite to mind control some humans on their team. Kuwabara actually received a vision about this and understands their backstory to an extent. He encourages the rest of Team Yurameshi to avoid killing them in a free-for-all match, regardless of the fact that he really doesn't have a plan to save both them and to win the round. Kuwabara gets his ass kicked, but fortunately Genkai, I mean the masked fighter, pulls out some technique to exercise the parasites from the humans. I wonder what it could be. The best outcome for everyone occurs, but unfortunately, no good deed goes unpunished as the tournament committee forces the next round to occur immediately, not giving Team Yurameshi time to rest. Because Kuwabara put himself and his team at risk to save people that he doesn't know, while noble, this is actually a chaotic good in the context of what's happening here. We still got one more fighter on our team. Let's go! Kuwabara is effectively removed from the story for the next six episodes due to his injuries. During this time, Hiei and the masked fighter are also removed from the round due to a technicality. So Yusuke and Kurama have to carry the team through four fights against a team of shinobi, including best boy Jin. Both Jin and Yusuke are removed from the tournament due to a double knockout, which leaves the leader of the other team as the deciding factor. Kuwabara stands up and intends to use the last of his spirit energy and die, but he knows that his team will move on to the next round. Hilariously though, this turns out to be completely unnecessary when Yukita shows up to cheer Kuwabara on, which completely rejuvenates him and he totally demolishes the Earth Ninja just so that he can show off to his crush. <laughs> This is one of the most relatable things in the series. That 20 scene, no notes. Chaotic good. <laughs> I wonder if Kazuma says these funny things to everyone. <laughs> Big clown. During the next five episodes, Yusuke is receiving the last bit of training with Genkai. Check out the Yusuke video for what's going on there. During this time, the rest of the team are fighting against Team Urotogi. I, I've said that wrong. I, I'm sorry, I can't say it right. The order of the rounds is determined by a dice roll, and Hiei, itching for a fight, blazes through the first round, and Kurama gets a nat 20 fight. But then, a game of rock, paper, scissors later, Kuwabara goes up against a pretty boy named Shishiwakamaru, who uses a magic cape to teleport him outside the ring. He loses the round, but meets up with the girls and directs them towards the correct new arena. They have a neutral. Kuwabara? Ma'am? You have a gentle heart. Use it. After Yusuke's training, he passes out yet again, and during that time, Kuwabara watches over him. That's it. Neutral good for watching your buddy. This is like one of those wild goose thingies. I was following some huge mega energy and then it all vanished. It's sort of strange that Kuwabara, the world's most spiritually sensitive guy, is somehow unaware of the death of Genkai. But whatever. He and Kurama encounter Suzuki in the woods and get a sword hilt and some reverse time juice, respectively, which should help them during the final round of the tournament. Kuwabara tests his new strength and meets up with the rest of his team to fight. Lawful neutral. Well, I don't see why the old broad doesn't have to be here like the rest of us. She's sick. I told you that. Aha! It just so happens I know a secret remedy that can cure all kinds of sickness. The finals are here. Kurama wins his fight but loses due to a technicality. And Hiei wins his fight in an absolutely nat 20 scene. Kuwabara is then called to face off against the Elder Tagoro brother and is getting pretty psyched out due to the Elder's cruelty. During the fight, Kuwabara learns of Genkai's death, and we get a very graphic confirmation from the elder Tagoro of what exactly kind of relationship that Genkai and his younger brother used to have. Kuwabara becomes irate that he wasn't told about Genkai's death and creates a spirit flyswatter to defeat the elder Tagoro brother. He then confronts Yusuke about it. When both Kurama and Hiei inform him that they were also not told about Genkai, Kuwabara cools down. Chaotic neutral. Win this. During the final fight, Tagoro is too powerful for Yusuke to defeat, but Tagoro isn't willing to let that slide. Genkai possesses Yusuke's spirit beast and tells Tagoro that in order to bring out Yusuke's full strength, he needs to kill one of his friends. Tagoro stabs Kuwabara, who goes down bleeding. Yusuke gets his Super Saiyan transformation and defeats the final boss. Kuwabara then reveals that he's actually alive, and despite the fact that Tagoro could have easily killed him, he didn't. 
Kuobara also didn't reveal that he was still alive because he understood that Yusuke needed the strength of loss in order to win. And Yusuke reacts about as well as you'd expect. The tournament is won, and their prize is the resurrection of Genkai. For faking his death and deceiving his friend for good reasons, this is actually chaotic good. Kuobara is a very special archetype of character that we really don't see a lot of anymore and that is of the gentleman delinquent. Despite my joking earlier, Kuobara is a healthy 14-year-old boy, and he'll go absolutely gaga over any pretty girl. But he knows how men are supposed to treat women. He is very respectful, albeit in his own weird way, and despite that he and his sister bicker like siblings, yeah, but it's the one thing that I love about Kuobara is how much he is a good man first and a punk second. Weeks ago on Twitter, sorry, x.com, I posted a poll asking which series is the manliest shonen, and Yu Yu Hakusho won by a landslide. Although, personally, I think One Piece is a little manlier, but let's stick to Yu Yu for now. A lot of people remember Yu Yu Hakusho as the manliest shonen anime, and I think a lot of that is because of Kuwabara's overwhelming, positive masculinity. The desire to protect the innocent, especially animals and women, the desire to master his own powers, and notice how he never actually trained with Genkai, he taught himself everything he knew. His desire to carve out his own path and damn anyone else's opinions of what he's doing, the desire to find the love of his life and to provide for her so that she'll want for nothing, his desire to lead a gang and to be the strongest ones in Japan, okay, maybe that one's not quite positive, but Kuwabara is teeming with the spirit of competition and best of all, he is overwhelming with a strong sense of justice. I love characters like Kuwabara, and I think we need more of these classic masculine characters. And frankly, I just think he is just the quintessential positive masculinity character. But tune in next week for the next member of the gang. And I hear he's a foxy kind of guy. That was a lame transition. But come back on Thursday as we take a look at another troublemaker, Korra. Thank you to the patrons, and I'll see you all next time.